Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. I said, we? Why do we need to show up to practice? Thought y'all were going to sing it. Somehow they voluntold me in the mix. I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word to 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting with verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting with verse 14. We're going to focus on three verses today. Um, for those of you who may not have a Bible, there may be one in the pew in front of you, and we will also have it on the screens. 
Over the years, I've heard a lot of false statements about the Bible. I've heard it said that the Bible is a book of stories about God, but it's not God's Word. I've heard the Bible is a book of fairy tales about a God that doesn't exist. It's just a crutch for people to lean on. I've heard the Bible is a book written by people on their own to convince people to live in a certain way. I will say this. If those statements were true, who would have actually created the story of a God that fits what the Bible says about him? Just think about what the Bible says about God, for those of you who, who may know. But I, I want to take a detour real quick. If you take a look at the writings about the mythological Greek and Roman gods, you see that the gods all had human weaknesses. Now understand, when I say gods, I mean little g gods. Made up gods. That's why it says mythological in, in front of it. Uh, same thing as the theory of evolution today. It's still a theory. All right? So we need to understand the wording. So um, these gods all had human weaknesses. Zeus, who was the ruler of all the gods, had a weakness for women, cheated on his wife Hera, and messed things up many, many times over. Poseidon was the god of the sea. He was very moody and had anger management issues. He would get mad and whip up a storm on a whim as punishment to anybody that came across his way. Aphrodite was the goddess of love. She was very vain and was unhappy in her marriage and cheated on her husband and she caused other marriages to split up. Now that sounds like a great kind of love, doesn't it? This is what happens when humans try to create gods. This is what happens when we try to create gods of our own making. You see, many times they look just like us. They act just like us. They fail just like we do. Why is that? Well, because we want them to fail like we do. We, we want to be able to mess up and go, well, God did that. I, I heard a, a pastor not too long ago. It infuriated me and, and it did the same for uh, many, many other pastors and theologians and professors and everything else. This one pastor got up and said that Jesus broke the law for love. Now, if you know what the scripture says, Jesus says that he didn't come to abolish the law or to get rid of the law. He came so that it would be fulfilled. He came so that the law would be held to in its tightest form, in the purest way. That's what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to break anything. Uh, so he's the one who created the law, if you will. But you see, we don't want a God that doesn't relate to us in that way. Here's the thing. We do serve a God who can relate to us. Look, he sent his son to earth to live just like we did. You know, he spent 40 days being tempted. He was hungry. He was thirsty. Satan himself came and tempted him. He, he wanted rest. He wanted something to eat. He wanted something to drink. Satan came at him from every angle. And Jesus just kept throwing scripture back at him time and time and time again. How did Jesus combat a lot of these people? He threw God's own words that they knew, that they had memorized themselves, but he threw it back at them and said, you didn't understand it in the beginning. Let me clear it up for you. Let me show you what God's word means. You see, we know that these other gods and, and these failures for gods are not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is everything that we can't be on our own. He has no weaknesses or failures. And listen, I want to ask you a question that I, I hope you already know the answer to. What is the best way to know God's love, grace, mercy, wrath, and justice? What is the best way to know about Jesus' love, sacrifice, and resurrection? How do we know the workings of the Holy Spirit in our lives? How do we know how to truly love others? The main way that this happens is by being people of the book. 
And look, as I begin this ministry, and we're just a few weeks in now, uh, there's some things that God's kind of led me to preach on. And if you start to put together a theme, you begin to understand that I am discussing, talking, preaching, uh, digging into God's Word to establish who I am as a pastor and to establish who we're going to be as a church. We're going to be a people of the book. I've had people in churches, uh, a church <laughs> that I've pastored, we had a disagreement on something, and we sat down right across the table from one another, and they laid out their uh, defense of what they believed. And all I did was open up my Bible, pointed to the Scripture, read the Scripture, and said, this is what God's Word says. Amen. Well, I know what God's Word says, but that's not my experience. Listen, I, I want to be as nice as I can here, but I'm going to be as blunt as I can here. I don't care about your experience when it comes to the truth of God's Word. I don't. It doesn't matter. Your experiences don't change what God's Word says. Listen, there's a lot of people right now who are changing their beliefs on certain major topics that seem to be big issues in the world today. Homosexuality was one of them. And look, uh, there are many sins. I'm just choosing one out of the ether here. But uh, homosexuality was one that even a lot of uh, politicians at one time said, we don't agree with this. This is not the natural way of things. This is not God's plan for man and woman or whatever. This, this is not it. And now they're, they're going, well, wait a minute, I'm changing my tune. I'm going to, you know what, maybe this is right. Oh, well, who am I to say who they can love and who, who they can't love? W what does it boil down to? Their experiences. I talked to a couple not too long ago. They said, you know what, I didn't believe in it until my son came out of the closet. And I looked at him as he told me in tears, that he was gay. And I said, who am I to deny him the one he loves? Look, you're not denying anything. We already know Amen. the truth. Just open the book. Read the book to them. Say, this is what God's Word says. Let's stand on this. The problem is, is we don't stand on this. That's the problem. We've got it right here. We've got it on our smartphones. We, we've got it so handy right now, yet we don't use it. We don't apply it. We, we don't um, use it for apologetics or anything else in our life to, to show people, that, look, we're not being mean. I'm not being bigoted towards you. I'm not angry at you. I don't hate you. I love you. And the reason why I tell you these things is because I love you. Because I have the love of Christ in my life. So we are going to be a people of the book. Let me give you a few details about the Bible. The Bible has a total of 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. It has been said that the Bible itself is not a book. The Bible is a library that contains 66 books. I've heard one pastor tell me before. He said, if you ripped one page out of the Bible, it threw away everything else. Now, he's not advocating to do that before somebody sends me an email. But if you rip one page out, he says, you will spend the rest of your lifetime trying to live up to it. One page. And you'll never perfect it. That's how pure God's Word is. 39 Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. Answers in Genesis, their website states this. The Bible was written over a period of roughly 2,000 years by 40 different authors from three continents who wrote in three different languages. Now, listen to that. Written over the course of 2,000 years. 40 different authors. Some would debate you know, who wrote Hebrews or whatever. At least 40 different authors from three continents who wrote in three different languages. Despite writing in radically different times and contexts, the Bible's many authors all told the same message about God's 
eternal plan from creation and the flood to Christ's work on the cross and the consummation of God's plan. You can find the same truth stated by Moses and the Old Testament prophets, Christ himself and Christ's apostles. You can find the truth in all of their writings, all of their teachings. It's all pointing to Jesus. That's the grand narratives of Scripture. We were created. We fell into sin. We were punished because of that sin. And the rest of that is the Savior on His way. The rest of that is just, hey, there is someone that's going to come who's going to save you from that sin. Uh, until that happens, you're going to have to kill uh, bulls and goats and whatever else and, and, and shed blood for that sin. But there's one to come who's going to do it once and for all, and that's Jesus Christ. That's all in the Bible. That's just the introduction. Let's get into God's Word. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. It says, but as for you, Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So, I'll give you a few points today about the Bible is. You'll see in your bulletin, if you had not seen it already, the Bible is and there is a blank there. That's because we're going to try to fill in that blank a little bit, just scratching the surface of what God's Word is. So, the Bible is God's Word. We need to establish that. This is God breathed, spoken, given, however you want to say it. The Bible is words directly from God's mouth. Amen. Now listen, they're spoken by God, spoken to men, and then written down by men under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So God speaks to people. God spoke to Moses. And what did we end up with? Anybody know? First five, right? First five books of the Bible. God spoke to Moses. And what did he do? He wrote it down. We've got it preserved today. God's word. Exactly what he said. We have it. So God spoke to men. Men wrote it down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now last week, I spoke just a little bit about how even though God used men to write the scriptures down... He did allow them a little uh, creative, uh, uh, I, I guess, ability in there. They're, they're writing to specific people uh, groups. They're writing to the people that they uh, are from, their, their hometown folks or their family or whatever it is. So they were writing to Greeks or they were writing to Jews or whoever. Um, and so through that, we see that each of the writers have a little bit different flair. But all of them have the same message. Amen. And that's Jesus is the Savior. Let's go through just a few verses here. Jeremiah 30, verse 2. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. Here's Jeremiah. Who did it say? Thus says who? The Lord. The, Lord, the God of Israel. God spoke, and what did he tell them to do? Write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. So God spoke to Jeremiah, told him to write it down, and guess what he did? We've got a book named Jeremiah after him, okay? Next, Habakkuk 2, verse 2. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. The Lord answered me, so God spoke. Write the vision. Write down what you have seen so that others may be able to see it as well. So that others would be able to read it as well. 2 Peter 1, verses 16 through 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. 
For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Wow, what a message through that passage. They said, first off, we've seen it for ourselves. We were there. We heard God's voice say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. L listen, we, we're, we're witnesses to this thing. But understand this. No prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Now listen, that doesn't mean that what you're getting right now is not my interpretation. That's what we're called as pastors to do. We're, we're called to read and study and dig into the Word. And then we proclaim God's Word as it is. And then we provide an interpretation. And heaven help me that I get that right when I stand in the pulpit and preach. Or when I teach. God help me that I would do exactly as He wants me to do. But understand this, God's Word itself is not from man's interpretation. It is God's Word directly given to us. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. And this is key, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Wow. I can just imagine what that would be like. You're... You're sitting at your desk, you're in your study, and you got your, your paper out, and you got your pen ready, and, 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 and I mean, you're getting ready to write, and, and you, you just begin writing. And I mean, you're just, you're just writing it out. And then when you get done, you go back and read it, and you go, wow, where did that come from? You know what, I've done that before when I was preaching. I would get up to deliver a message, and it was like the very last second. It was like God said, uh-uh, that ain't it. And, and my whole week of study and memorization and everything else, trying to stick to a, 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 an outline of some sort, God was like, mm-mm, mm-mm. Why, why was it different? Why did it change? I, I believe it was because in that moment, the Holy Spirit of God was going, uh-uh, that, that's not what they need today. That's not what's needed today. I'll give you a for instance. I was traveling around preaching at different churches um, once upon a time and I uh, was all over the place and God really blessed that ministry. But uh, I was preparing for this one church and, and I made it a goal that every church I went to, I, I wanted to hear from God and I wanted to preach the message that they needed. The problem with that is, in a sense... I don't know them. I don't know what they're dealing with. I don't know what their struggles are. Now, yes, here's what I could do. I could call the pastor up if I'm filling in for a pastor, if they've got one. I could call the pastor and say, hey, pastor, what are you dealing with over there? How many pastors do you think would love to hear that question? Because they were like, look, hey, there's like three topics I haven't preached on, but man, they need to hear it. So let me give you these three and you pick from, you know, one of those. They would love to do that. But would that be what they needed to hear? That week, I was preparing for this message, had prepared a message. As a matter of fact, um, I prepared the message and God said, nope. And he kept taking me back to the scripture and I, I, I said, nope. I don't, I, don't look at me spiritual. You, you've told God no to. Um, even if you didn't say it out loud. You didn't do what he told you to do. It's all right. But he kept drawing me back to the scripture, to the scripture, to the scripture. I developed a whole new message. Not on that scripture. I've still got those two sermons, by the way. They, neither one have been preached yet. Because I haven't been led by God to preach them. But it, the message that he kept bringing me back to 
was about gossip. Now, can you imagine being the visiting preacher and walking into a church and go, hey, open up to this passage, and they look at it and they go, what's the pastor been telling you? You've been reading my email? You've been hanging around in some of our parking lot meetings? You know what happens, all right? I got up and I preached it. I, I really didn't want to. But I got up and preached the message. And at the end, I did like I always do. I walked to the, the front doors and stood there to shake hands as people were leaving. And people came up to me with tears in their eyes. They were weeping. And they said, I don't know how you knew it. But, but that was exactly what we needed to hear today. Evidently, gossip was tearing that church apart. And God used somebody who didn't know them in that moment to give them exactly what they needed that would affect change in their hearts, in their lives, and then in their church. You see, that's what happens when men are carried under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not standing up here telling you that I always do that. Because I don't. There are times that I've gotten up and preached a message and I've walked out of here and my wife will look at me and was like, you're not happy with that, are you? No. Nah, I'm not. Then again, sometimes I walk out of the pulpit and I say, man, that was horrible. I'm just telling myself, that was a horrible message. And Ivy goes, wow, that was the best message I've ever heard you preach. <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just practicing up here. The Bible is God's Word, spoken by God, spoken to men, and then written down by men under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I thank God for that. But number two, the Bible is perfect. We need to understand this. Because if we don't believe this, then you can make it out to be whatever you want, it to, make it, want to make it out to be. You, you can turn it to be whatever you want it to be. People do that all the time. They, they say, well, you know, God is love because they got one verse that they heard in vacation Bible school when they were eight years old. And, and they go, well, God is love. And if God is love, then he loves everybody. Listen, there, I passed by recently a Unitarian Universalist church. There are many of them around here in this area, I've noticed. Uh, but this, this facility, at least, I don't know how many people were inside. But the facility was... Absolutely phenomenal, it's massive on the sign. It's, you know, we love everyone. Come on in, let us love you. Do you know what they believe, anybody? I can tell you what they believe. They believe that in the end, it's all going to pan out. That we're all going to end up in the same place. And so you can bring your God, little g, in with you. And we'll sing songs together that are spiritual, but not Christian, by the way. They're not singing out of the Baptist hymn book, I can assure you. They're singing songs about how God is good, God is love, God is accepting, God is forgiving, God is all these things. But they leave out one thing. God is just. So if we really believe that the Bible is perfect, then we have to believe that God is more than just love. He is also just. He is faithful. He is our comforter. He is our friend. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He's all of these things wrapped up in one package. The Bible is perfect. Let me read you Psalm 12, verse 6. It says, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. Anybody have a clue why that... Number seven is there. It's completion, it's perfection. God's word is perfect. The words of the Lord are pure words. So what does that mean? Well, first it means that the word of God is inspired. It means divinely breathed out by God. God is the inspiration for all of Scripture. He is the one who inspired writers to write it down. He is the one who spoke it to them to begin with. Uh, so it is inspired by God. But it doesn't stop there because it is also infallible. It means incapable of teaching error. 
So if you teach the Bible as it is, you will never teach anybody the wrong way. If you read it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you will learn it and you will never be led astray. It's incapable of teaching error. And then we get to the final one, inerrant. A lot of people will argue this one and they'll try to nuance it in different ways and, and say, well, you know, but yeah, I mean, but it's been translated. And this, uh, let me just get this out of here. Inerrancy is a quality of the original text of the Bible. Translations may err, but the original manuscripts penned by the prophets and apostles do not. Now, let me get something to you. This is why it is so important to use a word-for-word -word translation. I'm not going to get into Bible translations, and, and, and if I were to ask y'all, I'd probably get 20 different answers as to what you like, or, or maybe I'd only get two. And, but, but either way, you may choose something that somebody else doesn't choose. But listen, when you're choosing a Bible to study from, when you're choosing a Bible that you want to really learn what God wants us to learn, you need to pick something that's going to be a word-for-word -word translation from the original languages. And not all of them are doing that. King James, word-for-word. -word. English Standard Version, word-for-word. -word. New King James, word-for-word. -word. Now, now, what do they do? They change some wording to make it a little bit more in modern day English, but it's still a word for word translation. Read both of them side by side. You're not going to see any difference in the message that is there. But listen, you read something like the message, while it sounds great, I mean, you can read it, and man, the wording sounds phenomenal. And, 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 and I could use that occasionally and go, hey, I really love how Eugene Peterson wrote this. That's great. But listen, when you're going to study, you cannot use that to get good study notes from. You just can't. He, he, he's trying to use elaborate wording to make it sound so great and dramatic, okay? So we need to stick to Bibles that are word-for-word -word translations. And if we do that, I believe that God has preserved His Word from the time He spoke it to the time that we're in today. If God was God enough to speak it out and to have men write it down under His inspiration, I believe that He's strong enough to hold on to it. Just like I believe that if you become a follower of Jesus, you're really saved uh, through faith in Christ. That the same God who was strong enough to save you is the same God who's strong enough to hold on to you. Amen. So the Bible is perfect, it's inspired, it's infallible, it's inerrant, and finally, it's complete. Amen. We have some churches around here. I don't even want to call them other denominations, they're other faiths. And they'll say, yeah, we, we believe in the Bible, plus this. Let me give you one for instance. Uh, the Mormons, okay? Many of them are... Absolutely phenomenal people, great people. But if you were to become a Mormon, you couldn't just have a Bible. You would have a Bible, then you would have the Book of Mormon, and then you would also have the Pearl of Great Price. Three books. How old do you think the Pearl of Great Price and the Book of Mormon are? I'm not asking because I really want you to give me an answer, but I'll tell you. Um, Joseph Smith <laughs> de was delivered gold tablets from the angel Moroni. And on those tablets gave the Book of Mormon. And it was in the United States. Listen, as much as I love the United States, the United States is not in Scripture. Amen. All right? Joseph Smith didn't come over here and get some new revelation. No, God's Word tells us that when the Bible was done, it was done. There's no more adding to it. And listen, you've got a lot of people on TV, especially, that are claiming to be preachers of God's Word. And they're saying, look, I got a new revelation from God today. Let me share it with you. 
God shared with me. And you know, they got that word. God. God shared with me today. That, 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 no. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. You need to get off the stage. Surrender your certificate. Whatever it is. And need, you need to stop preaching. Because God's not giving you anything new. Now listen. God will give you insight into His Word that's already here. I'm not saying that He won't open up His Word and reveal things to you that's already there. Listen, Jesus did that when He was on the earth. I shared with you a couple of weeks ago. He said, thou, uh, the, the Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not murder. Jesus comes along and He says, If you've got anger in your heart, you've already murdered them. They're looking, wait a minute, no, 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 no. No, no. Ten Commandments meant kill somebody. Jesus is like, you don't understand. What comes out of you started inside of you. The sin was already there. Because you had hatred enough in your heart for them to kill them already. So let's understand. God's Word is complete. Revelation 22, 18 through 19 say this. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, remember this when you're watching those TV preachers. Be careful. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him or her, by the way, the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. Wow. What does he say in that moment? <laughs> Look, God says, if you're going to get up there and preach heresy, you're not a believer anyway. You're not going to have any share of the tree of life. You're, you're not going to spend eternity in that holy city that's coming down from heaven. So God's word is complete. And then finally we see that the Bible is profitable to us in every way. How is it profitable? The scripture tells us very, very plainly there in those verses. For reproof. What is that? Expression of blame or disapproval of the sin in our lives. So as we read God's word, and as we see what God has commanded us in his word, when our lives don't match up to that, the Bible is expressing blame and disapproval to us. Now, who's actually doing that through the words of the book? The Holy Spirit of God. That's who convicts us of our sin, who guides us into the truth. So it's good for reproof. It's also good for correction, meaning to set things right. What, what are these? Three R's. Repentance. Restoration, reconciliation. All three of those words. That's what the Word of God draws us to. It corrects us in when, when we do those things. So it starts off expressing blame and disapproval for what we're doing. And then it teaches us how to get rid of that and to turn unto Christ in the right way. So how do we begin with that? We repent of our sin. And through that process, we're both restored or reconciled to Christ. Listen, when you sin in your life, that sin is not just your own. You say, well, that sin is only affecting me. No, it's not. That sin will always affect somebody else. Cheat on your wife. She doesn't find out about it. I guarantee you it's still going to affect your relationship with your wife. It's going to affect your relationship with others. Eventually, it's going to tear things apart. Because what's done in the dark always finds its way to the light. Your sin is going to affect others. So when you sin, not only are you um, causing issues between your relationship with God Himself, you're causing issues with others. And so we need to be reconciled to Christ first, and then to others next. So repentance, restoration, and reconciliation. But we don't stop there because we want to finish up with it is profitable to us for teaching and training in righteousness. What does that mean? Right living. How we live rightly 
in the eyes of God. So what does it teach us and train us to do? Wow, <laughs> the list could go on and on. I'm going to give you a few of them. Uh, how we are to love God. How we are to love others. How to love our spouse and our children. How to respond in times of conflict. How to function as a church. How to be good stewards of our money and time. The qualities and responsibilities for pastors. The qualifications and responsibilities for deacons. I mean, the list can go on and on and on of what God's Word will teach us if we'll only dig into it. I know churches right now, they're not functioning in a biblical way. And when you say something to somebody about this being in an unbiblical way, well, it's just the way we've done it. Well, here's what the Scripture says. Why don't you bring this up? Why don't you read this? Why don't you share with the body of believers that, that this is the case? You know what? That's the reason why we got to this spot to begin with. is because we forgot Scripture and we just kind of did our own thing. We reacted to the situation, whatever it may be. Listen, when you've got problems in your marriage, there's always a problem with your relationship with God. There is. The Bible will tell you that. But the triangle of a relationship will always show you that if man and wife are at the bottom two corners of this triangle, as you're both going towards Christ, you're coming closer to one another. But when your relationship is not moving towards Christ and your spouse is, guess what? One's leaving you behind. And now there's some issues. There's some breakup in this relationship. This is why it's so important for families to stick together, to stay together. Why husbands and wives, and wives need to fight for their relationships. Why they need to attend worship together. This is why all this is so important. Because we need to be on the same path, heading the same direction. And if we are... We're growing closer to Christ. We're growing closer to one another. Amen. That's what's happening right now in this church. We're growing closer to Christ. And at the same time, we're going closer to one another. But if we take our eyes off of the prize, guess what's going to happen? Amen. We fail. We fall. We falter. We begin to notice that there are struggles not only in our personal lives, but in our church's life. What we need to do is, we need to pull this out. We want to know how to do something? Amen. This is where we look. I get that there's an element of business to the church. You've got to pay bills, you've got to do some other stuff. I, I, I get that. But every decision in the church is a spiritual decision. Every decision you make is a decision that God needs to guide us in. Amen. And when we fail to realize that, we take our eyes off of the prize, then God will stop honoring and blessing what we're doing. So for Oak Forest, let's be a people of the book. As Miss Kathy comes to lead us in a time of invitation, um, if you need prayer, if you want to speak to me, you want to come to the altar, it is open. Um, if you want to find me after the service, I would love to speak to you as well. If you don't want to come during this time, that's okay. Uh, we love you and care for you. Stand with us as she comes to lead us.